Since the start of the year 2025, I pointed one single telescope at one point in the sky and several months later and after 200 hours of exposure time, I finally have probably one of my most favorite images I have ever taken so far in this hobby. I'm not crazy, right? Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is Hunter from Mountain Astro Photography. And yes, I have pointed one of my telescopes to one certain part of the sky for what seems like several months. I started this target back in later January when it's first starting to rise up over the trees that are behind me. And then throughout the spring months, dealing with some very awful weather, just trying to capture as much data as I physically can by myself, the, mind you, to capture something that is rarely imaged whatsoever, but it is hiding in plain sight. Earlier in the year, I was doing a lot of broadband uh, imaging around the constellation of Ursa Major, particularly around where Messier 81 and 82 are, the Bone Galaxy and the Cigar Galaxy, because Around the outside of this field of view, there is some brilliant IFN structure. And what I found was there was something hidden in plain sight, but it wasn't in the broadband spectrum. It was actually in the narrowband, your hydrogen alpha and your oxygen three. So you're probably thinking to yourself, I probably use some crazy equipment for something like this. No, actually I use probably my cheapest setup that I have and one of the widest field of views too. Technically, it's not even a telescope that I used for this project. I used a camera lens of all things. In fact, it's this little guy right here, a camera lens, $400, brand new, or if you happen to catch one that's used, roughly around the two, the 250, we're talking about the Rokinon 135 millimeter camera lens. Now, this camera lens, is extremely common and well loved for doing wide field astrophotography. Reason being, one, the price of it, you can't beat it too much. And being 135 millimeter, you got a pretty wide field of view and it can accept camera sizes as large as, you know, full frame. I'm using an APS-C size sensor here and it does pretty good job. Now, for the reason why this camera lens is so well loved because of how fast you can shoot with this one is because you can get down to f2 with this wide field of view so you're able to capture a lot of light fairly quickly so for this project here i use the rockin 135 which is a canon camera lens 135 millimeter shooting down to f2 camera I was using was my color camera, the ZWO ASI 2600 MC Pro. Filter wheel in here using just a regular UVIR cut. I used an L quad enhanced for some light pollution when the moon was out just a little bit and a little bit of some narrowband, uh, dual narrowband filters like the L Extreme and the Ascar C2 to get more of like that uh, oxygen three and sulfur two spectrum. And just with this little setup here. Now, the GTI was a newcomer as of uh, April. So I was using my AM5 for this too when I didn't have two setups. But let me tell you, this is probably one of the coolest targets I've ever imaged. And just the sheer size of it. If you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, well, it was only recently discovered and only just a few handful of people have actually imaged this target. What I'm talking about is the Vulcan Nebula. Now there is a lot of mystery surrounding this target because we don't actually know exactly what it is. Is it like an ancient supernova remnant? Is it a very old planetary nebula? Is it a mission nebula? We really don't know the details of this because it's so darn faint. And I had even more of a challenge too because I was using a one-shot color camera. Now, doing broadband with one-shot color cameras, 
perfectly fine because you can really capture all of the color spectrum, your reds, your greens, and your blues, just perfectly fine. It's when you start diving into doing narrowband, that's where one-shot color cameras uh, really fall behind. Reason being because of the Bayer matrix that's inside of the camera. Because when you're doing narrowband imaging, you're kind of stuck using only portions of the sensor. So what am I talking about with that? Well, say you're shooting hydrogen alpha. Usually that is in the red spectrum. And how these uh, one-shot color cameras work, you have RGGB, which means 25% of the sensor is going to be dedicated to collection, uh, collecting the color red, 50% for green, 25% for blue. And unfortunately, when you're doing like hydrogen alpha and oxygen three, well, you're only using a portion of the capability of the sensor. That's why monochrome imaging is usually much better. But when I was doing this target, I didn't own a monochrome camera, at least for deep sky astrophotography. I have it for like doing solar or, you know, my guide camera. But it was only recently when I got the 5A5, it's when I finally kind of make that switch over to monochrome. But by that point, I was already too invested in this. So I really tried to push the limits of what you can do with a color camera. And we got some brilliant results from this too. I had a little bit of some help too. I had uh, some people, you know, helping me process this and supply just a little bit of some data. Uh, Spencer was able to contribute about 20 hours worth of data to add to my already 175 that I captured for this. He was in a little bit of a more uh, darker sky, Bortle 3, and he was using a monochrome camera, which made it a huge difference too in capturing the last little bits of detail. And then I had some uh, help processing through Caleb Jordan because these file sizes, let me tell you, were massive and my computer was struggling. So I had to break up the processing so much to get this to be able to have a final project. This, uh, I stopped capturing data for this back in June and it's literally taken like a month to process this because I'm dealing with almost a half terabyte of data because of, you know, the APS-C sensor and, you know, having to drizzle three times because I'm so severely undersampled with this setup. So I had a lot of things against me for, you know, making this image come to life. But I want to take you onto the computer now and show you what we've captured because it is absolutely breathtaking. Okay, so now we're on the computer and I am so excited to show you this image. Now, this looks like there is a lot going on, but there's actually something hidden in plain sight, especially when we start throwing in the narrowband data. But I first wanted to show off the 70 hours worth of broadband data right around the Bode Galaxy and the Cigar Galaxy. And what you see is just a tremendous amount of IFN in this region is so rich in IFN with these dark gray clouds spanning all the way across this image and there's even some really cool looking like smaller galaxies that are hidden too well it looks like potentially like a little nebula right there and some detail in some of these other galaxies now granted this is only a camera lens was picking up all of this Got another little cool galaxy right there. Uh, stars are looking very nice. Another looking uh, galaxy there and over down towards that region. More structured IFN all the way through that part of the image. Got another galaxy here, another one there. Uh, continuing to go over, we have this irregular galaxy here. That looks really neat. There's actually a little bit of some stars involved with that one and going up you got portions of the garland galaxy you can see there the garland and then here is some very high quality detail of the bogue galaxy and the cigar galaxy and you can see the uh, ha streams that are popping up all the way through but this is all in broadband mind you wait until we start adding a little bit more of the narrow band and this really begins to shine but 
I'm going to turn on one layer here and you're going to see something kind of just pop out out of nowhere because of 130 hours of hydrogen alpha and oxygen 3 data. There's something hidden and boom, there it is. This is what I was mainly capturing. This area is known as the Vulcan Nebula. Now this was a recent discovery as of this year of this what potentially can be a supernova remnant or an ancient planetary nebula but it is popping out out of the dust here right around this uh, IFN arc and you know we're gonna section it off with just the hydrogen alpha data here it's very rich as a matter of fact but it is super dim for the most part and it kind of sticks up. We're trying to really figure out exactly what this is and what it's responsible for. There may be a star that's hiding behind this really thick arc of IFN dust. And here's the oxygen 3 data of it too. Had to really start to bring it up. And it's this nice, you know, like turquoise color, you know, combining it all together has this wonderful looking portion of the sky and I can't believe this took 200 hours to even get to this point. One of the longest projects I have ever dedicated time since starting in the year of 2025 and that's been really my main goal of this year has been really spending the time doing some very long integration sessions and going after stuff that is you know not commonly imaged because everything else, you know, that I've done recently, I've been experiencing more with the monochrome uh, camera and with the newer setup. So I'm able to see, you know, a lot more detail in some of the uh, items. But I'm going to be using my uh, Yfield setup for doing some really long duration projects. And I do have another one that I plan on starting for the rest of this year. And it should hopefully have some wonderful uh, results out of that too. So... This is, you know, the final image of this ultra-wide view of the Bow Galaxy, the Cigar Galaxy, portions of the Garland, all of the IFN that is located around Ursa Major, and the elusive and not well-imaged area of the brand new discovered Vulcan Nebula. So I really hope you enjoy this. And if you have a chance to really, you know, dive into a target or to a region that you can spend, you know, 100, 200 hours on, if you have the skies, please do it because you will be absolutely blown away by the results. And I actually can't wait to have this printed and framed. And speaking of printing, I might be able to start opening up some prints for some of my images coming on down the line because I just got a photo printer of my, for myself and I'll be able to have that to my Etsy store. So if you like you know the video, leave a like, comment, subscribe. If you have any other areas of the night sky you want me to really dive into for doing a long project, something like this, let me know down in the comments below. I love doing you know long duration projects like this to really make them shine. I have a lot more videos coming up of different objects here that I've imaged over this past week. So it's going to be a lot of content coming along and more on door three. So thank you as always. Clear skies. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.